Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Risks of Coronary Artery Disease Post-Transplant, Myths or Reality. We're glad that you all could join us today, and we have a terrific presentation planned, and we're excited um, to share the, this information with you. My name is Leanne Swanson, and I'm the Executive Director for the Alliance. And for those of you who may not have joined us before on one of our webinars, I have a few introductory slides to go over and some logistical items before we begin today's program. Um, first, if you have any questions, all of the phone lines are in listen-only mode. So the only way to ask a question is to use our chat feature. And so if you look at the screen here, in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen should be a little blue chat box icon, and at any time during the presentation and certainly at the end, you can click on that icon and type your question, and then once the presentation is complete, we will um, be addressing those questions and the presenters will um, answer them in the order that they've been received. Again, we are recording this webinar, so we won't be opening the phone lines. That means all questions must be submitted electronically using this chat feature. Registration is currently open for our next Get Connected webinar series, which will be held June 12th. And this topic will be Getting to Yes with the Coroner and Medical Examiner. So um, if you want to register for that, please do so, and it's available on the Alliance website. Um, and then also our next transplant webinar is June 28th. Um, it's entitled, Dude, Where's My Liver? Is Cannabis a Barrier to Liver Transplantation? So we hope you'll join us for that webinar as well. And we've just opened our August Get Connected webinar. And in July, on July 19th, we will also be having our next innovation webinar, and it will be on uterine transplantation. And registration will be open for that webinar shortly. So for today's webinar, we are offering one SEPSI credit as well as one nursing contact hour, courtesy of Iowa Donor Network. And so everyone listening to today's webinar is entitled to claim the continuing education credit. So if you're listening as a group, which many of you are and, and many of you do, um, please make sure you get the evaluation email from your group leader, so the person who was registered for the webinar after today's webinar, you'll be receiving an email with the evaluation link. Please um, feel free to share that evaluation link with those that are participating in your group today. And then once you complete a brief online evaluation, it will allow you to receive your um, continuing education credits. As a reminder, for nursing credits, you have 14 days to claim your contact hours. And for SEPSI credits, you have 30 calendar days. So at this point, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Linda Oler. Linda is the Associate Director of Quality, Regulatory, Education, and Data for New York University Langone Transplant Institute in New York City. And Linda is also a member of our transplant webinar faculty for this year. So we're very pleased to have Linda helping us moderate today's session. And I will turn it over to Linda, who will introduce our speakers. Thank you, Leanne. Um, when I was asked to find speakers for this um, pro uh, program on risk of coronary artery disease post-transplant myth or reality, I looked right here in our transplant center because we do all organs here. So I thought, well, we have a cardio transplant cardiologist. Matter of fact, we have several. And we have uh, kidney and liver transplant surgeons. So. I thought the best way to approach this was to have both a cardiologist and a surgeon actually um, discuss this, this talk with us. So Bruce Galb is a kidney and liver transplant surgeon at New York University Langone Transplant Institute. After completing his fellowship in transplant surgery at UCSF in 2010, he joined NYU where he also serves on the ethics committee and serves as a safety officer. In April, he chaired a meeting at the Global Bio Bioethics Initiative at the United Nations here in New York. Each summer, he lectures in the International Bioethics Summer School in New York City. In addition to his roles at NYU in ethics and as an abdominal transplant surgeon, Dr. Galb also works closely with our composite tissue allograft face transplant team. 
He currently serves on the UNOS Ethics Committee as our Region 9 representative. Last year, he was listed in New York Magazine as one of New York's best doctors. He has published on ethical topics with Dr. Art Kaplan, who's also here at NYU, and has numerous publications on surgical topics, as well as our favorite A to B, A2 to B transplants. Our cardiologist, Dr. Alex Rayantovich, he's a transplant cardiologist here at New York University Langone Transplant Institute. He um, completed his an advanced heart failure and cardiac transplant fellowship at Columbia University in 2009. That year, he became the medical director of the ventricular assist device program at NYU and later became director of heart failure. He teaches in residency and fellowship programs on topics such as management of acute decompensated heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, and cardiogenic shock. He has published numerous articles on heart failure, ventricular assist devices, as well as chapters and books. He won Faculty of the Year Award for Cardiology at NYU. In addition to his work with the heart transplant team, Dr. Randovich, patients call him Alex, consults with the liver and kidney team teams on cardiovascular disease. Without further ado, I'd like to start with our program on risks of coronary artery disease. Dr. Um, Randovich will start the program. Alex? Thank you, Linda, for that nice introduction. Usually when I'm introduced, it's just uh, Dr. Antovich works here, but you, uh, you dug all that up, and uh, so thank you for the very nice invitation, and thank you for uh, asking me to speak. Um, so I don't want to give away the answer uh, to the question posed in the title of this talk, but um, the risks of coronary disease are very real, um, and uh, we'll try to lay out the foundation of why they're real, why it's important, and I think that the key point here is that patients come to us for um, transplantation with a history and a life led and often uh, a life that has led them to um, end organ dysfunction. Um, and these, some of these same comorbidities will also lead to uh, development of um, cardiovascular disease. So I think that's uh, very important to take into account that um, while a new life might start at the time of their organ transplant, um, besides that one organ, the rest of their uh, body has stayed the same. So uh, what is coronary artery disease? And um, you know, this is a very basic slide, but I think it's something to keep in mind. Um, this is plaque that builds up in coronary arteries, which reduces oxygen supply to the heart. And this is a very gradual process and develops over decades, um, usually of suboptimal lifestyle habits and comorbidities that we'll get into. Um, it is the number one cause of death in both men and women in the United States. Um, the key thing um, I think that not everyone remembers is that coronary artery disease is not just coronary artery disease, it's really cardiovascular disease, and um, vascular disease really is a systemic process. So patients that typically have some coronary artery disease or um, might also have peripheral vascular disease, might have cerebral vascular disease, so really, um, Cardiovascular disease is a systemic process, not just limited typically to the coronaries um, or the peripheral, peripheral arteries. And if you sort of break down what are the etiologies of cardiovascular disease mortality in the United States, um, roughly half are related to coronary heart disease, but a substantial amount are related to um, uh, cerebral vascular disease and stroke, um, to heart failure, um, to um, uncontrolled hypertension. So. Uh, the risk factors that go into developing this process, which is um, pictorially described, um, you know, patients go through decades of life with uh, normal coronary arteries um, that then develop small atherosclerotic plaques that continue to progress. Um, and over time, that plaque might rupture and uh, thrombus forms over that plaque, which is uh, this sort of a black, um, dark spot in the lumen of the vessel, and that obstruction is what causes either a, a stroke if it's in the cerebrovascular bed, or if it's in the coronary vascular bed, it'll cause a myocardial infarction. Um, and again, this happens over long periods of time, and it really wasn't until, um, you know, after World War II, um, a famous um, cohort study called the Framingham Cohort Study really allowed us to understand what are the risk factors um, that go into developing uh, cardiovascular disease 
And then the subsequent several decades in the 70s, 80s, and 90s were spent trying to identify risk factors that can actually be targets for therapy. Um, and the first one we'll talk about is hypertension. Right, so again, my, my uh, part of my talk is going to focus on the type of um, cardiovascular risk factors that exist uh, before the time of transplant. And what Dr. Gelb will focus on is that these risk factors do not go away, and in fact, they're actually um, often worse in post-transplant. So um, hypertension is, is quite common and increases in both men and women <clears throat> as, as people age. If you go to individuals over the age of 55, you have more than half of uh, people in the United States have systolic blood pressure uh, as um, elevated systolic blood pressure as defined as a blood pressure, systolic blood pressure over 140. And that continues to rise <clears throat> and you get over the age of 75, you're talking about two thirds of the population <clears throat> and almost three quarters of women um, will have um, hypertension. Now 75 is typically outside of the range of most solid organ transplants, but certainly when we talk about people in their 50s and 60s, I mean, so when more than half of the U.S. population will have hypertension. And hypertension is important. It is a strong risk factor for all types of cardiovascular disease. Um, if you look at age-adjusted um, risk uh, in, over in 1,000 patients, the light green are patients who are normal intensive, and the dark green are patients that are hypertensive. It is a very strong risk factor for coronary heart disease. It is a significant risk factor for certainly for stroke. <clears throat> um, it actually um, almost quadruples your risk of stroke in men and triples your risk of stroke in women, um, so uh, quite high, and also a risk factor for peripheral artery disease and a very, very strong risk factor for developing heart failure. So um, how do we manage this in a group of patients uh, that um, have not yet been transplanted, and I would sort of make the argument that we have to keep these same things in mind uh, post uh, heart transplant, that it's not just sorry, post um, heart on my mind, um, but not just post uh, solid organ transplant. Um, we need to do the same things pre and post transplant. So lifestyle modification is very important. Um, weight reduction will um, lower your blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, anywhere from five to twenty millimeters of mercury. Uh, adopting a dash diet that's one rich in fruits, vegetables. Um, Low fat dairy and reduced in fat will lower your blood pressure by 8 to 14 millimeters of mercury, um, and so on and so on. Salt restriction as well. Physical activity, uh, regular aerobic exercise uh, will lower your blood pressure anywhere from about 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury, and <clears throat> limited, limiting uh, alcohol consumption as well. So lifestyle modification is, is quite important. So... Again, hypertension exists in a large swath of the population before they get to transplant um, and will exist after as well. So uh, hyperlipidemia, uh, dyslipidemia are also important variables, and we could break down the components of cholesterol into the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, the good cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, um, the goal for men is above 40 and women is above 50. Uh, the bad is LDL cholesterol. The general goal is below 100. And then you have the ugly, which are the triglycerides, and the goal is less than 150. Now, what I would say about all of this is um, most of the focus really is on LDL cholesterol because that is the only um, subparticle of um, cholesterol that has been shown to be a target of therapy, meaning um, the therapies that reduce LDL cholesterol tend to also improve outcomes. Um, we have not shown the same thing with uh, triglycerides and or uh, raising HDL cholesterol. So again, uh, the, the sort of background therapy of statins, which most patients will get for dyslipidemia and, and um, certainly post-transplant, really primarily targets LDL cholesterol lowering. So this is some of the um, <coughs> data uh, behind risk. And again, much of that comes from Framingham. Um, the uh, higher your HDL cholesterol here on the, on the right, um, the lower your um, cardiovascular risk is, and um, the higher your LDL cholesterol, the higher your uh, relative risk of coronary heart diseases. Again, really LDL is the primary target of therapy here. So <clears throat> there are many statin trials, and I won't go through all of them. Um, this is a study looking at statins for primary prevention. Again, these are patients that have not had any um, cardiovascular event 
Um, they were placed on pravastatin or placebo. We certainly have more potent statins than this at this point. And again, patients that did not have a cardiovascular event, uh, so primary prevention, um, when they were put on a statin, it significantly reduced uh, the rate of heart attack uh, or death from coronary heart disease. Statins uh, for secondary preventions are even more potent, and their effects, um, and this is a very important point, seem to be completely independent of what your baseline LDL cholesterol is. So even patients that started with a low LDL cholesterol um, have a significant uh, risk reduction, um, very similar to patients that have a high cholesterol. So statins, seemingly somewhat independent of absolute LDL levels, have a significant relative risk reduction in overall mortality for secondary prevention and a 24% relative risk reduction in, um, in an occurrence of major cardiovascular events. So smoking, um, I think for um, you know, most solid organ transplants, we um, try to get patients um, off of nicotine. Uh, for some organs, it's an absolute um, contraindication. For others, it's relative, but I think it behooves all of us to get our patients to um, stop smoking because this is one of the strongest risk factors for um, having a myocardial infarction. And even modest tobacco use is associated with an increased risk of myocardial infarction. Um, the more you smoke, the higher the risk. Um, <clears throat> so uh, very highly recommended in the general population, but certainly for patients that were considering um, putting in uh, a new organ to uh, stop smoking, to not be in an environment with um, tobacco smoke, to avoid exposure to secondhand smoke. Um, and really, if a uh, patient's being evaluated for solid organ transplant, this should be part of every single conversation. Um, because uh, the last thing you want to do is give the gift of life and the patient dies several years later from a myocardial infarction. And, um, you know, patients that <clears throat> smoke before the transplant are obviously at higher risk of restarting, um, but the longer you can get them off of uh, cigarettes before the transplant, the less likely they are to resume after. And there are pharmacologic therapies as well, and what I will say is that sometimes you have to try two to three to four times, um, but uh, whatever you try, um, try, try, and try again, and, and really behooves us to emphasize this to our patients. So there are two pharmacologic uh, agents here that have been shown to be beneficial um, in, in addition to nicotine replacement to help patients quit. So again, this conversation should start the first time you evaluate patients uh, for a solid organ transplant. And my opinion is that this would be the first thing that you talk about when the patient comes in the room at every single visit. So uh, obesity has uh, certainly become a pandemic uh, in the United States where um, large swaths of um, our population is burdened with obesity, particularly um, really a problem all over the country. But if you look um, down south in 2010, um, really this is where the heaviest burden, where you have a greater than 30% of the population um, is saddled with um, obesity. And obesity, even independent of the risk factors that go with it, um, hypertension, diabetes is a risk factor for um, hemorrhagic stroke, ischemic stroke, and ischemic heart disease. And we do have to keep this in mind when we're evaluating our patients for, for transplant and certainly um, for, um, you know, hearts, uh, which I mostly deal with. You know, there are a lot of implications, and most um, centers do have absolute cutoffs of BMI of uh, 35 um, but across the board, for any solid organ transplant, um, getting within a normal range of weight is, is key to avoiding these non-transplant-related complications. So um, these are our recommendations, and many of us work with nutritionalists, and we're um, lucky enough to have them on our team. But consuming a well-balanced uh, diet, uh, managing their energy expenditure to how much they take in, and really modifying food choices to uh, reduce their saturated fats, uh, trans fatty acids, and, and limit salt intake. But um, getting down to a, um, a reasonable weight is, is really important pre-transplant. <clears throat> so for the most part, specific diets have not shown, been shown to have a benefit for cardiovascular outcomes with the exception of a Mediterranean diet, and that's a diet high in intake of olive oil, nuts, fruits, vegetables, uh, moderate intake of fish and poultry, and low intake of dairy products and processed meats. 
Um, and uh, this in a population with uh, type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular risk factors um, has been shown to reduce um, overall cardiovascular events, including MI, CVA, and, um, and CV-related deaths. So again, uh, the Mediterranean diet is the only diet that's been shown to reduce cardiovascular events. So um, diabetes is uh, one of the last topics we're going to talk about here before we get to Bruce's part of the talk. Um, and diabetes is a risk factor for um, really both microvascular and macrovascular events. Um, it is a risk factor uh, for developing end-stage renal disease, uh, for losing limbs, for strokes, for coronary artery disease, um, and other. And altogether, this is in totality a 10-year risk of a macrovascular event, which is peripheral vascular disease, a stroke, or a heart attack is almost 30% at 10 years. So quite a significant risk, and we can consider this a um, cardiovascular equivalent. So even if you've never had a CBA or um, an MI, just having diabetes puts you at the same risk as if you've had one already. Um, so the best way to avoid complications of diabetes is to avoid developing uh, diabetes in the first place. So um, there are patients that are at risk. They develop prediabetes, and this is an important trial that looked at uh, the comparison of um, placebo metformin and lifestyle changes. So lifestyle changes mostly um, were diet and exercise and weight loss, and you're likely to developing diabetes if you have prediabetes were reduced by almost 60% by lifestyle changes and 30% by metformin. And most people remember this study because we like our drug, um, that metformin was beneficial. But really what was much more beneficial here was the lifestyle modification. So again, early counseling with physical activity, weight loss, working with a nutritionist is key to avoiding even developing diabetes if you don't have it yet. So um, our population in general in the United States um, is very similar to what I'm displaying here in Canada. We do not move much. Um, more than half of our population outside of sort of the adolescent age range is what we consider sedentary. They do not get at least 30 minutes of physical activity three to four times a week. Um, so getting our patients moving more is key. Um, and while there has not been a good randomized trial to show that physical activity reduces um, the risk of death from a cardiovascular cause, there is clearly an association uh, of reducing death rate the, uh, with more activity. So move more, die less. So these are general guidelines. You know, I think ideally we would like our patients to come within the range of a BMI of between 18.5 and 24.9. Uh, with women developing a waist circumference of less than 35 inches and men less than 40 inches. And if our patients are overweight, um, it is highly recommended that they lose at least 10% of their um, body weight, um, and that will make it much less likely to, um, for them to develop diabetes. So um, my last sort of therapeutic that I'm going to talk about here is aspirin. Um, Aspirins are different than statins. Uh, the benefit of aspirins for primary prevention in our modern um, studies is much less so, so meaning um, it's much less clear how beneficial aspirin is if you've never had a heart attack or a stroke. But as a secondary prevention, so people that have known coronary disease or have had a stroke or have had an MI, um, it has a quite significant uh, reduction in all-cause mortality. So for secondary prevention, this is a strong recommendation. I'm in the pre-transplant community. For primary prevention, there is some current controversy. Uh, so this is an interesting slide, and this looks at the cardiovascular disease event rates. This is a very um, large population of Medicare-insured patients, and this compares <coughs> patients who have um, end-stage renal disease, uh, patients that have chronic kidney disease, uh, patients that um, um, have been transplanted, and patients that have no um, CKD. Uh, and what's very clear is that if you've been transplanted, um, you are better off than having end-stage renal disease or chronic kidney disease as it relates to developing 
um, cardiovascular disease, but you still are at uh, increased risk, uh, particularly as it relates to peripheral vascular disease or congestive heart failure. Um, though uh, for myocardial infarction and cerebral vascular accidents, um, your risk significantly goes down to almost uh, the risk of a population without chronic kidney disease. Um, and again, this is not a randomized trial, and I would say there's a lot of bias here because once someone has had a transplant, they are typically meticulously managed by transplant teams. But, but what I do want to say is that your risk of cardiovascular disease does not go away post-transplant. Um, heart failure, which is what I do for a living, is a bad disease, and having any increased risk of this um, is very unfavorable. And peripheral vascular disease and um, limb threat is uh, also a very bad thing. So in, in our program, uh, we have a multidisciplinary team um, that evaluates patients um, pre, lung, uh, liver, and kidney transplant. Um, what I've put up here are our algorithms for how we evaluate patients um, for risk of coronary disease heading into their transplant. And really most of this is uh, to figure out who the patient is and try to identify a cohort of patients that are at increased risk of um, deleterious cardiovascular outcomes at the time of their surgical transplant. Um, so most patients, um, whether it be liver or our renal transplant evaluation algorithm, uh, most patients with diabetes or um, multiple risk factors will end up um, getting a left heart catheterization. Um, we will avoid stenting patients with um, non-critical disease, um, but really it's knowing who our patients are and what their uh, risk is uh, for having a, a negative cardiovascular outcome. So I'm going to stop right there and um, pass it over to Dr. Gelb. Alex, thank you very much, and Linda, thank you very much for the very nice introductions for both Dr. Rantovich and myself. Um, I'm speaking to you as a surgeon today, but in reality, in transplant surgery, the, the operation and the surgical part is only about 15% of the patient care, and we spend a significant amount of time managing the patients, both keeping them well enough to be transplanted and then maintaining their health afterwards so they can enjoy their organ for as long as possible. The survival after transplantation has uh, been improving over time. Um, Five-year survival right now for kidney transplants is approximately 75%, and 10-year survival is 50%. If, uh, if you look at the survival of patients on dialysis with end-stage renal disease without a transplant, the, the survival is about the same as it is for a brain tumor. It's, a, it's about 20 to 25% at five years. So transplantation really gives these patients major survival benefit. Um, liver, we see similar outcomes. Intestine not as good, uh, and then uh, hearts and lungs, and then VCA or vascular composite allografts, which are hand and face transplants, are still relatively new in the field, and the patients with the longest surviving face transplants are only about 10 years out, so we don't have long-term data on that yet. If we look at cardiovascular morbidity and mortality after liver transplantation, a lot of my slides are going to show data from either liver transplantation or um, kidney transplantation. But the, these can be extrapolated to the other organ systems as well. And if you look at all these, are, a lot of these are risk factors for coronary artery disease. The, uh, the bars on the left side of each of these uh, groupings is at baseline and then after transplant, you can see that the incidence of dyslipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, et cetera, um, are, are quite higher after transplantation. The, the one difference we do see uh, in the group is uh, the patients who smoke, that decreases. That's probably through a lot of counseling, and a, fa a fair number of transplant centers won't even consider a patient for transplantation if they're actively smoking for the reasons that uh, Dr. Rangevich mentioned, but also because of the risk of malignancy. People who are smoking a pack of cigarettes per day after a kidney transplant, approximately 40% of them will develop a incurable malignant neoplasm within, within five years. And if we look at the overall cardiovascular morbidity and mortality after liver transplantation, there are a significant number of events, either MIs or uh, episodes of heart failure, 
uh, that occur over time, and that steadily increases, although the number of fatal events does not, is not the same. Um, it's, uh, it increases steadily, but, but, uh, but not nearly as much. And I think some of this has to do with the, the close care and close follow-up transplant patients receive in a multidisciplinary fashion. So what's killing our patients? The, uh, the, the pie charts on the top are for liver transplant patients. The, the overwhelming majority of transplant recipients don't die because of failure of their transplanted organ, but because of other reasons. And if you look at the liver population, approximately two-thirds of patients die with a functioning graft um, and die from non-hepatic reasons. Of those people who are dying from non-hepatic reasons, about 20% are dying from cardiovascular events. And in the, uh, the, uh, the etiology of death, that, that comes out to about 12.5%. The kidney population is much more. It's closer to 60%. And this is in part because of the ESRD population. The kidney transplant patients have a much higher incidence of uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, disease and peripheral vascular disease. One of the key indicators that uh, progresses cardiovascular disease is the incidence of post-transplant metabolic syndrome. And this parallels the general population that aren't transplant recipients, but it has a much higher incidence and accelerates much faster after transplantation. Some of this because of the effects of having a functioning organ and feeling well, but also because of the medications that we use. Um, to remind everyone, metabolic syndrome is the constellation of obesity, dyslipidemia with low HDL, which is a good cholesterol, high triglycerides, hypertension, and diabetes. Risk factors associated with this, the older you are, the more likely you are to have a metabolic syndrome. Increase in weight after transplant. If you have diabetes before transplant, the likelihood of developing uh, or worsening diabetes uh, is, is definitely there. After transplant, very few people who are diabetic before transplant will not be diabetic afterwards. And I'll show in the later slide the, the incidence of new onset diabetes after uh, transplantation is significant. Uh, patients with a smoking history um, or patients who smoke afterwards, and then also many of the medications that we have to use to prevent rejection. If this is a, this is a study from uh, 2007 in the liver transplant population looking at the uh, morbidity of cardiovascular events in patients with and without uh, metabolic syndrome. You can see the patients with metabolic syndrome have a much higher incidence of cardiovascular morbidities. The prevalence of metabolic syndrome parallels the obesity rates uh, through the country. If you remember Dr. Rainsevich's slide of worsening obesity epidemic, um, the general population is about 25% across the United States. In the liver transplantation, it's about double that. Um, and if we look at the, uh, individual factors of post-transplant metabolic syndrome, such as dyslipidemia, it's threefold higher in the, in the transplanted population. Hypertension is prevalent in almost two-thirds of transplant recipients. Um, elevated blood sugars and diabetes in over half, and obesity is, uh, is almost double the pre-transplant population. Hypertension is something that is very frequent after transplantation. We see it in over half of our patients and up to 85% of some recipient populations. This is due to a couple different reasons. Um, some of it has to do with which organ is transplanted. Patients with liver failure uh, in the cirrhotic physiology before transplantation typically have a relatively low blood pressure, and once cirrhotic physiology resolves, that can unmask hypertension. And then when we add on calcineurin inhibitors, and that's our main immunosuppression medicines, tacrolimus and cyclosporin, these medications cause renal vasoconstriction and a decreased uh, glomerular filtration rate and also impaired sodium excretion. All of these lead to a higher blood pressure. And then the use of steroids, many transplant programs uh, continue patients on a low-dose steroid throughout their transplant life. Some, patients, uh, some programs do have steroid withdrawal protocols depending on the organ type, um, but steroids in general also cause sodium retention and as a result water retention. And they also suppress the nitric oxide system, system um, which, uh, which upregulates up blood pressure. So the combination of these two medications in particular is what drives a lot of the hypertension after transplantation. <coughs> 
Um, we talked about steroids and calcineurin inhibitors. Um, calcineurin inhibitors are also diabeticogenic. <coughs> um, mTOR inhibitors, and these are the medicines everolimus and sirolimus, which are used less frequently but are used for immunosuppression. These, uh, these are noted to have hyperlipidema, particularly in the triglycerides, um, and uh, uh, sequestration of, uh, of fat and tissues. And then also, you know, after people are transplanted, they feel great. Their friends say they look normal. They can't believe how good they look. So appetite returns, cachexia resolves. People go out and celebrate and, uh, and eat more. And the, the first couple months after transplantation, particularly for non-kidney transplantation, we actually want patients to gain weight because they, they, uh, we want them to put on more uh, muscle mass. But usually about six months after transplant, that starts to shift and we're telling patients that they need to go on diets and watch their weight and exercise. New onset diabetes after transplantation, uh, the uh, graph represents the, uh, the incident of new onset diabetes, so this is uh, de novo diabetes for patients who are not diabetic before transplant who become diabetic afterwards. Early after transplantation, many patients um, become uh, new di newly diabetic. Some of this resolves, and that has to do with the high-dose steroids and the higher doses of the calcineurin inhibitors that are used early after transplant. About a third of these patients, if they become insulin dependent, may come off insulin or off medications altogether. But the overall incidence of uh, diabetes after transplantation increases over time. And if we look at 10 and 15 years out from transplant, 20 and 30 percent of uh, organ transplant recipients are diabetic. And in this patient population, there's a two to three times incidence of coronary events. How do we treat hypertension in transplant patients? The, uh, the, because of the transplant medications, particularly with the calcineurin inhibitors, we always have to watch out for medication interactions. There are tons of them in the transplant world. Um, we want to avoid medications that affect the cytochrome P450 system whenever possible. Um, first line treatment for, uh, for hypertension, loop diuretics are fine, such as furosemide, um, calcium channel blockers are quite good, and these also help can or can help offset the vasoconstrictive effects of sacrolimus and cyclosporin. Other agents that are perfectly acceptable are nifedipine and amlodipine. We generally like to avoid verapamil and diltiazem, uh, particularly because they affect the P450 system and will affect the metabolism of the calcineurin inhibitors and as a result affect sacrolimus or cyclosporin levels. Uh, beta blockers are first line for patients with known coronary artery disease. Second line agents, thiazides, we do have to uh, be somewhat cautious about. There's a higher incidence of hyperuricemia and gout in the transplant population. Thiazides can make this uh, worse. Uh, ACE inhibitors, particularly in diabetics, are fine. Uh, caution must be used, particularly in kidney transplant patients early after transplant because the uh, kidney's ability to all regulate uh, the, the vascular tone is affected and ACE inhibitors can cause an abrupt uh, renal failure. The overwhelming majority of transplant recipients can be maintained on two agents or less. About half can be maintained on a single agent alone. Obesity in uh, liver transplant patients uh, reflects uh, what we see in other transplant patients as well. Uh, about one out of five non-obese transplant recipients will be obese within two years after transplantation. Post-operative weight gain, as I mentioned, is uh, partly a, a reversal of malnutrition, but also celebrating health. And then additional factors in that are steroids, increased appetite, um, the, the dietary restriction, particularly in the end-stage renal disease population, uh, goes away. And when you tell a patient that they can eat pretty much whatever they want, they just have to avoid grape juice, they, uh, they can frequently go on a pizza and cupcake diet um, and celebrate. Um, and in the liver failure patients and the heart failure patients, they're on a very, very strict sodium restricted diet. And as these improve over time, those restrictions go away to become more liberal with, uh, with food in general. And for many patients, because they've been sick for so long, they're no longer sick, they feel well, so they have an appetite for the first time in years. Obesity among uh, transplant patients, um, 
has not been stable. It's been increasing just like the obesity rates in the general population over time. In the, in the 1990s, we were looking at about a 15 to 20% obesity rate in, the, in transplant recipients, and now it's upwards of 30%. How do we treat obesity? Uh, as Dr. Rainsevich commented, it's, it's incumbent upon us as transplant caregivers to continuously educate and counsel our patients. Um, they, they really have to follow a diet, they, and they, they firmly believe that exercise is the, one of the most important things. A lot of the studies out there, we see that a good Regular exercise is better than almost any single medication we have as far as improving diabetes, hypertension, and controlling weight and appetite. Surgical weight loss is an option. Uh, generally, in these patients, the, uh, the uh, procedure of choice at the moment is a sleeve gastrectomy because this doesn't affect absorption of medications like a gastric bypass does. Um, we always counsel our patients to avoid pharmacological weight loss agents. These can uh, cause end organ damage or potentially interfere with the transplant medications. It's just a big unknown and it's, uh, it's quite risky in these patients. Management of hyperlipidemia. Uh, about half of patients will develop hyperlipidemia after transplantation. Risk factors include female gender, having cholestatic liver disease. Uh, if, uh, if, you're, if you have hyperlipidemia before transplant, obviously it's a risk factor afterwards. If you're diabetic before, you'll probably be more diabetic afterwards. If you're obese before transplant, it's probably only going to get worse. And then on top of that, we add our pharmacologic agents for uh, prevention of rejection. How do we treat it? As I said, lifestyle modification is probably the single most important thing. Um, watching what we eat, uh, changing medications. If someone's on an mTOR inhibitor and they really have a severe dyslipidemia, looking to change it to something that is not going to affect cholesterol as much. That always has to be balanced in with the other risk factors of the other medications and individualized to a particular patient as well. Uh, as Dr. Rejtovich commented, the statin day keeps the cardiologist away. Uh, fibric acid derivatives are, uh, are certainly uh, fine for patients with high triglycerides as well, although you do have to watch for an increased risk of bile stone formation in the liver transplant population. Um, Medications to avoid are mainly uh, medications that will interact or affect absorption of, uh, of the transplant medications. Reducing cardiac risk after solid organ transplantation, complete smoking cessation. I can't stress this one enough. Um, it, smoking, quitting smoking is very difficult to do. What I tell my patients is that before transplant, smoking is bad for you. Get a finger shaken at you. It's not, a, it's not something you should be doing. After transplantation, it will kill you. Um, you're either going to have a cardiac event or you're going to get cancer. And the uh, going through transplantation, getting an amazing gift, and then shooting yourself in the foot by smoking cigarettes is just, is just not an option. And I counsel my patients, they really have to decide do they want to live and have a transplant or do they want to keep smoking. Um, they, it's, it's that important. Regular physical activity, half an hour every other day, every day is obviously preferable, um, but the, it's hard enough to get people to, to exercise three to four times a week. Patients should not be more than 100%, 120% of their ideal weight. Um, we will counsel our patients to see nutritionists if we see weight gain, and if they continue to gain weight, we'll counsel them and refer them for, for bariatric surgery if needed. Um, careful lip lipid management and then blood pressure management, as Dr. Rancevich commented on earlier. So how do, you re how do you reduce the risk of coronary artery disease and cardiovascular disease after solid organ transplantation? Um, prevention is, is probably the main theme of today's talk. Very aggressive pre-transplant management of cardiovascular disease risk factors are important. And in our patient population, Intense surveillance and risk reduction in key populations. The, the, the transplant eligible patients and transplanted patients who fall into high risk categories need to be followed quite closely as part of their follow up and transplantation medication. Um, individualizing immunosuppression strategies should also be individualized based on the patient, looking at their overall risk of rejection, what organ was transplanted, and their other comorbidities as well. 
And then I think one of the most important things is making patients part of your team. The, uh, if you collaborate and educate your patients and make them experts and engage them in that, and they're a key stakeholder rather than being passive and just taking their medications, that's the, I think that's the true way to success and long-term uh, good outcomes in our patient population. So the, the, the question of the talk was, is, uh, is coronary artery disease in the transplant population myth or reality? And I think my final slide will sum that up. And, uh, and with that, we'll move on to any questions the audience has. Thank you, Dr. Gelb and Dr. Ranovich, for a, a wonderful, insightful presentation. Um, we really appreciate sharing your expertise. Before I turn it back to Linda, who will help us moderate any questions, as a reminder, um, the way you would ask a question is on the bottom left corner of your screen, you'll see a blue chat icon. And if you click on that, um, it will allow you to type a question, and then we will moderate and answer your questions that way. Um, while we are waiting for questions, I would ask for those of you who are listening in as a group, um, on your screen right now is our meeting poll. And if you can just um, reply to this poll and let us know how many people are listening in as a group, it, help us, it helps us give an, get an idea of um, how many people are um, participating in our webinars. So Linda, I will turn it back to you to moderate our questions. Thank you. I want to know, uh, this is going to be for our surgeon, I'm going to ask Dr. Gelb, what flags should trigger an actual cardiology consult? When do you call for Alex to come in and see one of your patients? At what point? Sure. In the, in the pre-transplant evaluation, patients that we identify, in the, particularly in the kidney side, who have <clears throat> risk factors for coronary artery disease, um, particularly the diabetic population or patients with a known history of coronary artery disease. One of, one of the issues with the uh, dialysis patient population is that non-invasive studies like an echocardiogram and a stress test don't have great sensitivity and you can miss uh, significant coronary artery lesions. So we, we refer all of these super high-risk patients over to our cardiology group for evaluation. And if they do have a lesion, we get uh, an idea of the regular follow-up and uh, if they need a cath or if they need an intervention and, uh, and how to follow them afterwards. Any patient in the kidney transplant population afterwards, um, if, uh, if they have known significant disease, we make sure that they have close cardiology follow-up uh, throughout their transplant life. And then the, the usual triggers that we use um, are if there are symptoms. In, in the kidney transplant population, Interestingly, after the first month or two after they're out of the early operative phase, they tend not to have myocardial infarction. They tend to develop heart failure as, a, as symptoms of their cardiovascular disease. Um, and this can sometimes prevent, present as, as kidney dysfunction. So any patient with kidney dysfunction and some known heart issues, we make sure our cardiologists are, are carefully following. And the liver transplant candidates, if they have significant coronary artery disease going into transplant, they're probably not going to be a, a candidate because once the cirrhotic physiology reverses, we're probably going to have a lot of uh, cardiac issues. And in, in uh, the post-transplant population, it's usually we refer for, uh, for signs of cardiac disease. Thank you. What would, um, at what point do you think you should have a cardiologist actually sitting in on a selection committee meeting. You mentioned that there was quite a increase in cardiovascular disease in the kidney population. Having a cardiologist sit in on some of these uh, selection committees and looking at all of the test results, do you think that would be a benefit and does that happen? At NYU, we actually have one of our cardiologists that uh, evaluates our patients sit in on all of our selection committee meetings. Um, this, uh, this helps in a couple ways. One, we can really discuss as a team how to manage the super high-risk and moderate-risk patients. And the low-risk patients, we can review uh, testing and develop a plan of care or if additional 
cardiology workup is needed. So I, I personally think it's invaluable to have our cardiologists sit on the selection committee and be a key member of the team. Um, those are the two questions, three questions that I had. Um, and then I think Alex has given us a new slogan for the American Heart Association. He said, move more, die less. I put walk more, die less, so I think we need to call the American Heart Association and give them the new slogan from Alex. That's all I have. I'm from Brooklyn. We tend to be, uh, we tend to be dramatic, so. <laughs> Move it or lose it, right? <laughs> yeah. Linda, it looks like one additional question just came into the Q&A box. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, do you require all diabetics and persons over the age of 50 if they're on dialysis to get a left heart cath before kidney transplant? Um, so in, in our um, algorithm, um, and that is, I don't think you guys have access to the slide, um, but in our algorithm, if you're a diabetic, um, you are going to get a left heart catheterization. Um, and, but it's not everybody over the age of 50. So if you're a non-diabetic, if you're over the age of 50 and you have a negative stress test, then those patients do not. So again, um, if you're over the age of 50 um, with, or if you're over the age of 50 with diabetes, you will. If you're um, over the age of 50 without diabetes, um, you will um, get a stress test and if it's negative, you can avoid a cap. But all, all diabetics in our program I get catheterizations. Then with wait list management, what would you do, what, what point would you say that cath had to be repeated in some of these patients? So, um, so in, in our program, um, we're doing that every, every two years. What about a kidney patient? So if, if it really depends. So I mean, if you had if you had the initial indication. So for the uh, for the kidney patients, if um, you had a left heart cath and you didn't have obstructive coronary disease, but you were a diabetic and you had some coronary disease and you're getting it um, every two years. Um, if you're not a diabetic, um, and then those patients are getting it every three to five years. I'm, I'm not sure about other programs. I think at NYU we probably cath. Well, we're, we're more on the cath heavy side. Uh, as a surgeon, I think that's useful because if there is a lesion, if even if we decide not to treat it, if we know where the lesion is, it lets us have an idea of what the peri transplant risk is, and if uh, if there is an event, whether it's going to be the it has the risk of being a significant event that requires a trip to the cath lab and intervention or something that we just have to, to monitor closely. But it, it arms us with information as well as determining whether someone is a candidate or not. All right. Okay, it looks like that is the end of our questions. Again, I want to extend my sincere thanks to Dr. Gelb and Dr. Ranovich and Linda, thank you so much for your time and help Oh, we do have just one last quick question. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Linda, do you see yeah, it from Leanna? Is, uh, yes, Leanna Frost. Do you have an absolute BMI contraindication and tobacco use? You. Yeah, so for BMI for kidney and liver transplant patients, um, you know, for, for liver patients, it's preferably a BMI of under 35, though we will push it a little bit. We have an absolute cutoff of BMI of 40. And for our kidney transplant patients, we have a relative cutoff of a BMI of 40, partly depending on their body habitus. If it's mostly truncal obesity, it's more firm on that side. Um, but uh, if, we, if we hit a BMI of 42 to 43, patients must lose weight to be transplant eligible. And then as far as tobacco use, we have a firm policy of tobacco cessation prior to transplantation. I have one more question. 
trying to read it. It says um, if the patient is temporarily 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 inactive, would you would that affect the timing of the testing? Did I say that right? Yep. I think that's for question. If a patient is inactive on a transplant, transplant with a status list. seven, seven. <clears throat> would that affect timing or delay whether you would do a left heart cath or not? Um, as a transplant surgeon, you know, if we're if someone's going to be inactive on the list for a period of years, I don't see a strong indication for performing a cath unless there's unless there's another indication. But as we get closer and put the patient back on the active side of the list, we would need that testing done. Alex, do you have any comments on that? No, I, I I would agree. I mean, if they're not actively listed, and once they depending on the length of time, but if it's for a prolonged period of time, then you know everything sort of resets when they come back on. So, so if it's been years, then you sort of treat them like it's been years, if it's been a few months. And so it all depends on how long they've been inactive. And as a surgeon, do you think the BMI or the waist measurement is more important? Is that for me? Um, yeah, you know, as a surgeon, your, the circumference of, as, as an abdominal transplant surgeon, the bigger the circumference of your abdomen, the more difficult and challenging the, the surgery is and the higher risk of complications. It's all relative. Um, but the, the more trunk of obesity, the, the more difficult the case and the, the harder the recovery and the, the higher the risk of complications is. I, I counsel my patients that if they can run away from me when we're going to go to the surgery, they'll do just fine. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you both very much. Yes, thank you both so much, and thank you, Linda. And I want to thank all of our participants for joining us today, and we look forward to having you join us on our June webinars. And I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day and rest of the week. Thanks, everyone. Take care. <laughs>